It worked. It it worked terribly. Can you hear? Yeah, I turned it back on. Can you can you hear me, Velma? Can you hear me, Velma? Okay. Yeah, I believe that. Okay, we're gonna uh, get started with. Um, first of all, to see how your small groups went. Uh, what was your understanding of? the characteristics that make a person moral. Any particular words or thoughts, expressions come up in that discussion that you care to share with the larger group? Yes. So that morality can be built sort of from the basic experiences of, of life, of upbringing, of decisions of good and evil apart from any particular instituted religion, religion sort of like that is not necessarily connected to a particular religion in that sense. Is that kind of what you're saying? Okay. Anything else that came up? in your discussions. Yes. So we were talking about that morality is um, a third chicken in that watching. If you're watching all of that question. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it's uh, that's that's probably the best judge of a moral person is what do they do? What do they do when no, when they know nobody's watching, kind of that characteristic of in, integrity as well. Anything else? <laughs> they didn't catch that on the video. <laughs> Anything else? Nothing exciting about spring break, huh? All right. Um, it was immoral. I was very moral <laughs> across the board. Everything was moral. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't my intention with the topic. Spring break and morality. <clears throat> Why I pushed it to this week. We need to talk about some things. Um, <laughs> so anyway, let's uh, we'll go ahead and formally get started with uh, with our scripture passage, which is actually from the book of Genesis, chapter one. <laughs> I've got too much stuff here on the table. Genesis chapter 1, verses tw- starting with verse 24. Genesis chapter 1, verse 24 and following. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth every kind of living creature, tame animals, crawling things, and every kind of wild animal. And so it happened. God made every kind of wild animal, every kind of tame animal, and every kind of thing that crawls in the ground. God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame animals, all the wild animals, and all the creatures that crawl on the earth. God created mankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fertile and multiply, 
Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that crawl on the earth. God also said, See, I give you everything, every seed-bearing plant on all the earth and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit on it to be your food. And to all the wild animals, all the birds of the air, and all the living creatures that crawl on the earth. I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened, God looked at everything He had made and found it very good. Evening came and morning followed the sixth day. Heavenly Father, we praise You and thank You as we gather tonight. We continue our journey of Lent. And as we continue our journey closer to the celebration of Easter, of the Easter Vigil, we, in a special way, continue to ask for Your blessing upon us. Continue to lead us and guide us according to Your plan, according to Your will. Make us ever more open to Your presence, trusting and humble. Help us to always see the ways that You reveal Yourself to us, and we pray for that Spirit to be upon us tonight, especially that we might continue to open our minds and hearts to what it is that you would have spoken. We pray these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So with the topic of morality and current issues, I thought it fitting to start with that particular passage from Genesis, because it's in that passage that we see the way that we, we are deemed created by God as set apart from the rest of creation. That as human beings, humankind is given a special gift by God. And that we are created in a unique way in comparison to the rest of creation. We are created in a unique way that it says He creates them with His image and likeness. Or I guess more specifically, not His image and likeness, but their image and likeness. If you notice that passage, it says God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. And so believe from the from the beginning the way that that scripture passage is written is to reveal to us something more about God leads to that trinitarian understanding of God of God in three persons and so the passage in the plural God speaking that let us make men in our image and likeness so a special gift is given to creatures to a particular creature, and it's important, this distinction, because it's especially becoming blurry more and more in our world today, Uh, the value of human life seems to be continuously declining, while the value of the rest of creatures and creation for some reason seems to be increasing. So much so that in many people's minds and many people within our culture today don't see much difference between the value of human life and the value of animal life, of plant life, that they're all life and that we're all kind of on an even plane. Now that's not to say that animal life is not valuable, but to put it on the same level as human life um, would be certainly against our understanding of how we are created as unique and beautiful 
and with a unique um, image and likeness of God. This is kind of shown in some of the cultural things that you see, music and movies and stuff. Perhaps you've heard that song. It's getting a little old now, but one of my all-time faves. I'm being sarcastic. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do it on the Discovery Channel. No? Nobody, nobody knows. Nobody knows that one? Seriously, nobody's heard of that? Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Don't pretend like you don't know it. <laughs> it's on my iPhone. Let me pull it up real quick. No, I'm just kidding. Got it on my on my on my iTunes here. Um, so I think I was being sarcastic. That is not necessarily. It's not in my top ten. Um, so, but I think it's interesting, and I, hopefully it was written as a bit of a joke. But I don't think it was necessarily that. In many people's minds, there isn't much difference to human beings and the rest of the created world of, of animals, of other mammals. Um, but as Christians, as Catholics, we certainly believe that there is a distinction and that this distinction is revealed to us not only in the scripture and divine revelation, but this, this distinction is revealed to us in, in natural ways, in natural law, that there is a basic distinction between the different abilities of creatures Certainly in a lot of people, you know, in studies with, with primates and stuff, you know, obviously they're finding unique means of communication, but you're not seeing primates, chimpanzees and such create symphonies, create unique works of art. Now obviously certain mammals and certain animals are able to mimic painting, mirror painting. I don't know if you've seen, there's some clips of like uh, elephants now that can, there's some pretty talented elephants I guess that can, can uh, paint really well. That's actually kind of a cool video, uh, elephants painting. Check that one out on YouTube. <laughs> right now, check it out. Please don't check it out right now. Um, but anyway, um, but as, as gifted as they are, they'll never be in that same level as we have been given in terms of the gift of human life and the, and the fact that we believe we are created in the image and likeness of God. And what does that mean? That we have been given free will. And an intellect. So that our intellect guides our free will to be able to make decisions and choices uh, that our intellect has been given to us to continue to guide the freedom that we have been given as human beings. Free will, which leads us into another thing that we have been given as human beings, which is conscience. So the capacity to choose to judge something as good or evil and choose accordingly is the gift of being created in the image and likeness of God, a gift of intellect and free will. Ultimately, that decision-making capacity is within our human conscience. How do we understand conscience? What is conscience? We believe it to be. And it's an important thing because as we talk a little bit about morality, oftentimes I think there can be a tendency to go, with, okay, morality is sort of a list of rules, right? A list of what's right and what's wrong. Morality is a list of, of what you can and can't do. Morality is, you know, it's the Ten Commandments. It's the sexual rules and, and things about uh, marriage and sex that the church has a list of rules about. But it goes beyond that, and the fact that morality, rather than being just a listing of 
knows of a listing of saying don't do this and don't do that, behind every no within moral teaching is a much louder resounding yes. So in the Ten Commandments, for example, when God tells us do not kill, what underlies that in terms of moral teaching is that life is beautiful and sacred at all stages, in all ways. So behind every moral code or moral teaching is a much, should be a much louder resounding yes. Behind every list of moral don't is a do, a yes, a gift. And so that, that is what I want to start with, is talking about how do we understand recognizing the value of what, of what we've been given in terms of conscience, in terms of that, that great, beautiful ability. So we have been created in the image and likeness of God with freedom to choose and to be influenced by intellect and ultimately with the responsibility of forming our conscience. And if I were to talk about the, the most fundamental four principles of moral, of the moral teaching of Christianity or of the church, they would basically be these. We have an obligation We must follow our conscience. So the first principle of morality is that we have an obligation to follow our conscience. However, before we have that obligation of following our conscience, we have an underlying obligation of forming our conscience. And what does that mean, to form our conscience? It means to basically use our intellect, to grow an understanding of what is right and what is wrong, using revelation to help us understand what is right and what is wrong, both divine revelation but also natural revelation, what, what is natural law, some of the fundamentals of, of our existence in the natural world, the basic principles of natural law um, being that things like life is sacred. Um, and then divine revelation being scripture, but then also the tradition, the guiding principles and teachings of Christ's church on earth, which is what compi is compiled in tradition. So in order to form our conscience, we have to use our intellect to continue to guide and to learn and to build and to make those small decisions. If the eyes are the window to the body, to the human body, you, know, you hear that in romantic language, that the eyes are sort of the, the window to seeing, um, to seeing who somebody is. Um, then in an in analogous way, the conscience is the window to our soul. And so much so that our eyes guide us through this world to avoid pitfalls, to avoid things that might harm us, might cause us, might cause us uh, yeah, danger or hurt. Um, so too, our conscience is that which guides us in the spiritual realm. And so, in the same way as it might if I were to greet Christina on a daily basis, saying, hello, Christina, it's great to see you again how are you, and then, and then poke her in the eye. She might be like, ow, that was rude. But most likely in that initial poke, not any real permanent damage is going to be done. But if every day when I saw Christina, I said, hey, how you doing? And then I poked her in the eye. Most likely after days, weeks, 
of doing that, there's going to be some long-term repercussion for that activity, the eye-poking activity. Uh, in an analogous way, so too is the forming of our conscience, an individual choice to do something that is presented to us as evil is not in the long term going to form our conscience, but it is those daily experiences of choosing things, choosing between right and wrong, choosing good or evil. And the more that we choose the good, the more that we form our conscience in a positive way, which leads to habitual action. And that's where you get the traditional descriptions of Good habits and bad habits. You know what those words are? Virtue and vice. So the more that we form our conscience in a positive way, the more that we make those continual good choices, the more that we form good habits, and those good habits then turn into virtue, and we become virtuous, or as we were describing at the beginning, a, a moral person, not exactly synonymous, but have a lot of the similar characteristics. And in the other way, the more that we allow our conscience to be formed in a negative way, or as it is formed in a negative way, we condition ourselves with bad habits, which ultimately can become vice. And so because our conscience is a great gift, we are to use it according to the means and the way that it is to be used. Um, and the challenge then is when we start to slip in forming our conscience in such little, small ways, sometimes we don't notice the damage, the long-term damage um, that's being impacted by, by our... our um, by our difficulty in forming our conscience, by the mistakes that we make in forming our conscience. The examples that are um, used so that one example of being poked in the eye, but the other example that I used in a homily not too long ago is uh, that example of putting a frog into room temperature pot of water and putting it on the stovetop and slowly increasing the heat that the frog, if you s just slow enough, if you can slowly but surely over a long period of time raise that temperature that the frog will happily boil to death. But if you put that same frog into a pot of boiling water, that reaction to the difference of environment will cause the frog to jump out of the boiling water to safety. And so much, I think that example sheds light on the state of our cultural conscience, but also the way that individual conscience can be influenced and affected by its environment. As I said in that same homily, the ways that some would have reacted to television today, people that lived 60, 70 years ago, how they would react to primetime television today. And again, is that just because they were puritanical? Or is it because we've slowly but surely, degree by degree, slipped further and further away from God's plan, God's will? It's said that uh, now that, and this is something I was planning on talking about a little bit later, but I think it shows this, this example that one of the, the moral teachings of the church is against euthanasia or assisted suicide. And as soon as the door is opened to choosing when life has lost its value, it's a slippery slope. It's been in the news somewhat recently that Belgium, for example, who had legalized assisted suicide some time ago, 
has now allowed for child assisted suicide so that a, it can be chosen um, on behalf of the child. The child has to agree to it and the parents have to agree to it and I guess you have to get two doctors to sign off on it. But that a child who is terminally ill or struggling some from, from some form of uh, disorder, uh, that assisted suicide is legal now on children in Belgium. Just interesting how that slope kind of continues. Um, and it's interesting to observe if, and then not in some, you know, uh, in some sort of into the world type mentality, but it's important for us to be able to step outside of things and to see those things which we have allowed to go to slip. And, and especially that's important in our own lives. Certain things that we held as valuable, certain actions that we held as not being something that we would ever do. As we perhaps get older, as sometimes we can develop certain vices, we slowly but surely can slip into activities that we would have never imagined for ourselves. On the opposite, obviously, is how virtue works that we can counteract that by continuing to form our conscience in a positive way. The interesting thing about that scripture passage from the book of Genesis that I, that I started off with is again that the distinction that we have amongst all of creation and on the sixth day, whereas with the other days, God saw what he had created and it was good on the sixth day, God saw what he had created, and if you noticed, it was very good. Again, that distinction between what we have been given as human beings, the gifts that we have been given as human beings. So that first principle of morality is that we form our conscience and then we are bound to follow our conscience. The second being that no evil can be done for a good outcome or in another word, way that you've probably heard it is the ends cannot justify the means. No matter how great the potential good is, the ends cannot justify the means of getting there. An example with that would be stem cell research, and it's important clarification on that because sometimes you'll hear people say, why is the Catholic Church against stem cell research? That would be incorrect. The Catholic Church is not against stem cell research. The Catholic Church is indeed against embryonic stem cell research because embryonic stem cell research causes the destruction of a human embryo. And secondarily, which perhaps is even more important, the, success, the successful uh, testing that they've done uh, is typically I don't know, 90% of it is done, or I'm throwing out a number, but I know it's uh, that there's not been a, my understanding is that there's never been a successful case of embryonic stem cell research that has been used to help cure a disease or a condition that all of the successful ca test cases that have taken place have happened with adult stem cells or um, umbilical, umbilical stem cells if that's the right word, but anyway, the example I was using, off track there, if you can imagine, the example that the ends can never justify the means, so in the case of embryonic stem cell research, as hopeful as the ends might be in, in you know, finding ways to end certain diseases, certain conditions, 
the hopeful end that we might find can never be justified. We can never justify the destruction of human life to achieve a great end in that case. So the ends can never justify the means. The principle of totality So for the sake of the overall health of a human being, we can modify or remove a particular organ to preserve the rest of the body. So the example, the example would be, um, there would be situations where to remove a cancerous tumor, if the secondary effect was sterilization, which the Catholic Church teaches is wrong. But if it were done to remove cancerous uh, or a diseased uh, ovary or a cancerous tumor on the ovaries or on the uterus, um, that, that would be justifiable based upon that principle of totality. That that choice, the intention was to remove this this uh, tumor or diseased organ to save the entire person. The secondary or the negative effect would be causing infertility or sterilization, but if done for that reason of preserving the entire person, the total person, totality, that it would be justifiable. Does that make sense? To everybody else? Is that okay? And then the the and then the last one would be in some cases the principle is that we have to choose lesser of two evils. So in a situation where it is unavoidable, where evil is unavoidable, we have an obligation, according to that principle, to choose the lesser evil. Um, Uh, the example that is used with that is something like a pilot who is crashing a plane. Uh, obviously, it's an unavoidable evil that, that that plane is going to crash. To choose the lesser of the evil would be to choose, you know, going away from populated a populated area, um, or to choose between crashing into a house or into a school. The lesser of the two evils would be to crash into the house, even though it's going to cause the loss of life, of possibly the loss of life of a family. It would be avoiding the loss of the life of, of many children and many, many lives. So in a situation where it is unavoidable, the choice must be made according to this principle for the lesser of the two. Now the important distinction there is sometimes this principle is used to justify certain moral issues. One of them being um, the situation of abortion, for example, on a mother who the doctor has claimed is in danger of death if she goes forward with the pregnancy, if she goes forward with the delivery of the child. And that's sometimes used, the, an attempt is made to use this principle that we're choosing the lesser of the two evils. Well, in this scenario, there is no lesser evil because both human lives are of the same value. So to say that one life is lesser than the other is inaccurate. Also to say with that, there is no 100% certitude of such a condition. Um, there's 
story after story of women who have received that advice from their physician only to choose to have the child and only to choose to, for both to survive. Um, it's one of, the, one of the more modern saints is actually St. Gianna Mola. Um, who, she was an Italian mother who actually died in childbirth after choosing to have the child. Um, I know it's obviously an evil. It's a horrible, horrible thing. But there is no, in that scenario, no lesser of those two evils. So, uh, Any questions on any of those basic? So basically as an introduction to morality, those are kind of four of the basic principles that you would get in an intro morality class in terms of Christian morality. Um, so no questions? Cool. We are going to take about a seven minute and 42 second break. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the current issues. Did you check it? <laughs> okay. It's true. All right. So some of the current issues that I wanted to talk about um, and one is that question of um, not only euthanasia but end of life treatment is an important question uh, especially if one is assigned as durable power of attorney for an individual and in their, in their will, that you have end-of-life decisions to make uh, with your loved ones. And there's some important moral questions that come up when it comes to the end-of-life treatment of an individual. Um, so obviously, intentionally assisted suicide or euthanasia is in all cases morally wrong. Um, so there is no scenario, no disease, no terminal illness that would justify ending the person's life, no matter the suffering. Um, and that's one thing that as Christians we have, as Catholics, we have a unique, obviously, view of that. I remember when Pope John Paul II was coming to the end of his life, and for the last few years of his life, he, he uh, suffered with Parkinson's. I think it was Parkinson's. And um, so it was very debilitating to the point where, you know, he was barely able to get around, hardly able to speak. And I remember uh, a commentator on the news making some reference to him being a lame duck pope at this point. And I couldn't help but think, now, perhaps more than ever, is he speaking the truth of the gospel message, which is that we have a unique p option, possibility to participate in the sufferings uh, of Jesus Christ. And that's what we believe about the meaning of human suffering, is that there is meaning to human suffering because of the sacrifice that Christ gave us on the cross. And that there is only one ultimate promise that Christ gives us if we wish to be His disciples. And that ultimate promise is if you wish to be his disciples, you must take up your cross and follow after him. So there's basically only one ultimate 
you know, truth that he will tell us in terms of what the Christian life looks like is that it looks like carrying the cross in imitation of him. Um, and so there is a deeper meaning to human suffering, to our own suffering, as we unite it to the sacrifice and suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, and so in those last years, in those last days, last weeks and days of the Pope John Paul II's life, I think there were some very powerful moments of him, because he, you know, he could have, he could have uh, stepped aside, he could have you know, retired, uh, resigned from the, the papacy, but I think there was value even in to the last moment of him continuing to live, even to the point of being of needing to be served, to the point of where he was even, you know, slobbering out the, the side of his mouth that there is even in that stage a dignity of our humanity and a beauty to the opportunity to participate in the cross of Christ. So anyway, there is no human scenario where the ending of the artificial ending or choosing to end a human life is justifiable. Um, and again, that, that's a no that goes back to the resounding yes of the gift of life no matter what. It's becoming more and more common for the choice of abortion according to conditions of the fetus after tests are done, if, if there's Down syndrome or some other type of, of disorder that you know, the, the option of choosing uh, abortion is given to parents and is becoming more and more common. There's no scenario, there's no disorder, there's no disease, there's no uh, chronic illness that could devalue life to the point where we can decide to choose to end it. So when it comes to end of life issues, there are a couple principles to take into consideration that there is ordinary care extraordinary care, or sorry, ordinary means of treatment, extraordinary means of treatment, and then normal care. Normal care is the thing that is necessary for every person, which is basically that this is what is, is necessary, necessary to give to every person no matter what stage of life they are at and that's the basic necessities of food, water, warmth, and hygiene. In other words, it's referred to as basic nutrition and hydration that we have a responsibility of giving that to a human being that is able to process it no matter what. So even somebody in a vegetative state, for example, uh, who doesn't seem to have brain activity, but their body continues to process food and water, that we have a responsibility of providing food and water, that starvation and dehydration cannot be the cause of death. So that's the basic, that's, those are the basic boundaries of normal care. And then there are other ordinary treatments and even extraordinary treatments that we do have a, a freedom of choice with. So ordinary treatments are defined as the procedures that are known to be beneficial and not excessively burdensome, but also those depend upon the condition or upon the uh, the disease or the age of the individual who has, uh, who is struggling. Um, so you are not expected to have, for example, you're not expected to have, you don't have to have a surgery to remove, you know, a cancerous tumor if it is going to cause greater discomfort and, and um, so that there's not a moral responsibility to to surgically remove something uh, that's going to cause distress uh, upon the person, upon the family, upon the individual. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. There is also not a necessity of leaving an individual on a respirator. Is that the right word? Uh, that if they're not able to breathe on their own, that is, that is morally acceptable to remove somebody from uh, a respirator. It is, not moral, it is not morally acceptable to remove them from hydration and nutrition. Even if it needs to be intravenous, as long as the body continues to process it, we have a moral obligation to give it. As soon as the body starts to reject processing hydration and nutrition, then we, then we can choose to forego it. And there are conditions where at the end of life, the body starts to shut down and it starts to not be able to process food and water and causes, yeah, some pretty crazy situations in the summer of chap chaplaincy that I had in the hospital of a family that was unable to say goodbye and so they continued to demand that they be pumped full of drugs and hydration and that they continue to try to resuscitate and it was, it was sad. So anyway, um, so there's a value, there's an importance as well as, uh, that a person can choose to allow natural, you know, natural or unnatural diseases to take effect if the choice is for uh, quality of life. If it comes to quality of life towards the end of life, one can choose to forego means of treatment in order to attain a, a better quality of life for those last months, years, weeks, whatever it is. That makes sense. Any questions about any of that? Yes. What? <laughs> Sorry, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, so you're asking the decision. I, I, one thing that I'll state, and I'm not 100% sure if this is what you're talking about or if it's what you're asking, but that's why it's important when filling out one's end of life, one's will, when choosing uh, a, a person to be the power of attorney for yourself um, in those end of life times, is because if that person is not, does not know what you desire in that scenario, then that person has the power to continue to do everything ever possible to try to keep you alive. And that was the case with this particular patient that I witnessed uh, as, as a chaplain was the family, there was, no, there was no designation of DNR, which is do not resuscitate. There was no, no designation by the individual of what means of treatment that, that she wanted to receive. And so the family member who was given that decision could continue to do everything medically possible to keep that person alive. I think this is probably the opposite of what you're asking. Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, but I, I think it kind of correlates in the sense that you want to make sure that you choose somebody who knows the basic moral teachings of, of our faith uh, when it comes to end-of-life issues. And on the other hand, the, there is no moral responsibility to stop trying to treat the individual so I couldn't come in and say that this 
family who was choosing to do every possible thing to try to keep that person alive, I couldn't come in and say, well, that's immoral to do so. I mean, there is a certain ability that we have to try to preserve human life. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Does, do you have a clarifying <coughs> question in any of that? Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Like a teaching, yeah. like a policy. Yeah. Um, no. That is correct. <laughs> uh, I am not 100% sure um, on that. Okay. Sort of like there's a lesser a lesser value to their life or something, and so they're okay if they. Like if that's okay for their parents to decide if they choose. That is an interesting question. I've never dealt with that. I've not I've not heard. Um, my 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 initial. Well, no, because I mean, there's not a there's not a teaching that you have to. In my understanding, there's not a teaching that you have to resuscitate somebody. Um, so I don't know. I would have to. I'd have to look that up for sure. But yeah, way to go. You stumped me. It's good. It's good. So now I have two things I need to look up. Yeah. <laughs> and she has chosen you as your durable power, uh, durable power of attorney. She has made a grave mistake. Uh, <laughs> oh boy! No, that's right. You're like, no, no, she doesn't need, she doesn't need that appendi appendix removed. <laughs> I know it's first, but no, anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Okay. <laughs> um, some of the other... I guess moral issues that we talked a lot about. We talked a lot about a lot of the moral issues and we talked about the sacrament of marriage because a lot of morality, especially um, the moral, moral teachings of the church tie into sexual morality because those things are tied into the sacrament of marriage. And so a lot of the issues today when it comes to technology, uh, when it comes to medicine tie into the way that technology is able to affect uh, both the conceiving process um, as well as technology is able to affect the, well, yeah, the conceiving process, whether it's contraception, whether it's means of artificially conceiving. Uh, so I'm not going to go into those because we did talk about in those scenarios, if in any way one of the two purposes of that marital embrace of sex is removed. So the openness to life and the bonding of the relationship, if one of those two things is removed, then it becomes uh, outside of the purpose or the way that God gave it to us and therefore is immoral. Um, and I think I talked a little bit about you know, like in vitro fertilization, artificial insemination um, I think another example of something that would go outside of and it seems like it's kind of died down from where it was when I was in high school was the talk of of cloning which I don't know I'm sure there's still testing and, and stuff being done in that regard but typically 
my understanding of cloning is that it's done uh, in a laboratory and therefore life is produced artificially outside of the, the basic means of life being produced and therefore would be immoral on that, on that basic grounding um, in the sense that it's basically bringing forth life artificially in a, in a test tube or in a petri dish type of a thing, uh, which obviously is a perversion of the way that we believe we're given the gift of procreation. Um, so, yes. Yes. Uh, where well the question was, what about animals? Um, I think I'm not 100% sure what goes into the process. I suppose if the process of cloning an animal brings about um, suffering and death of many animals, then, then it would be frowned upon. But if it is just that process of trying to produce uh, the same genetic um, animal, then I, my understanding would be that it, that, that would be okay. Um, because we don't hold the same dignity to the procreation of animals as we do to human beings because of where we started tonight in terms of how we are created in the image and likeness of God. So, so, so that's the same with, you know, plant life, obviously, you know, lots of different strains of things being created through science and such that are resistant to certain diseases and that, that, that type of thing I think is, is morally okay. And so too with, with animals. Um, yeah. Do you have a question with that, sir? Genetically modified organisms. Uh, what is that? <laughs> like what? Plant like plants being meta modified? I don't. I don't think there is. I think that's acceptable to genetically modify plants or even or even animals in certain scenarios. I guess. Um, I'm trying to think if there are certain scenarios where genetic modification to an animal would be considered immoral or outside of, I suppose if it, again, if it's a modification to an animal that causes that animal undue suffering in some capacity, then I would say that that would be outside of, um, yeah, you got an example? No, question. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, that's great. No, I didn't know there's an ear. They grew an ear on the back of it. Huh. Was it? It was just the appendage or it actually had like an eardrum and everything with it? Okay. So, I mean, obviously, in that case, if we can do it, we should do it. I'm just kidding. No. Uh, so I would think that would be an undue uh, suffering for the rat to run around with a giant ear on its back. Um, and if there's no ultimate benefit, I'd have to, yeah, I mean, I'd have to double check if there's any particular teaching on that, but my, my initial thoughts would be, yeah, that that is cruel, <laughs> and that there is cruelty to animals that would cross the line of moral moral treatment of animals. So, yeah.
Uh-huh. There was no, uh, you know, so that the type of timing of what was occurring was not just sporadic. Um, did, did science just cruising out, not to do so much, but we now know so much more over 40 years? Um, is there a, and I realize abortion, Mm -hmm. There is, I mean, there is a level of culpability that tr that has changed according to our knowledge of what's taking place. So, it, that's the case with any particular sin. The more knowledge we have of what we're actually doing, the more we're held responsible for that knowledge. I'm trying to think of another example of something where, where our knowledge would impact, um, you know, would impact the decision that we made. Uh, and that's why, you know, that's one of the missions of you know, like the Knights of Columbus, is to provide every pregnancy center with, with the, uh, um, and now, now they have 3D um, what's that called? sonograms, um, which are amazing. Um, but that's one of the missions of the Knights of Columbus, is pro providing every pregnancy center with a 3D sonogram, because typically a mother who is wrestling with that decision and sees a 3D sonogram of the life within her womb uh, has a less difficult decision to make, uh, or a less, there's typically less wrestling going on with that decision after seeing, um, you know, the interesting thing about that is test tube babies are almost a proving that reality that the organism is something completely separate from the mother. I mean, obviously, the, you know, the argument is that it's, the mother's body, it's the mother's choice. What kind of test, you know, test tube babies kind of prove that that's not true, obviously, that it's not the mother's body. It's a, a completely separate entity uh, life. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your yeah. I'm question. Just wondering Right. But then, you know, we just we didn't know what what was actually transpiring when we when we had abortion. Yeah. In 1972, like we do today, when we definitely have the you know knowledge of what the pain may be suffering. Mm hmm. And that's part of the reason why I think it, it continues to exist is that we m mostly don't know or want to know when it comes to that because we'd rather just leave it as a decision that's made for the, for the good of my life or whatever. Um, I know those are the times in my life where I was most transformed on the issue is or not transformed, but just re kind of vitalized on the issue is just watching some of the the videos that are out there of, of actual abortion procedures. There's actually a video footage of, of abortion procedures, just a normal everyday abortion that takes place and what through the sonogram actually goes on. Uh, it's it's uh yeah, it's pretty crazy. So and I know, well, anyway, yeah. 
stop there. As with every moral teaching, when we come up against a moral law, a moral code, um, it seems to us, especially if we're resistant to it, it seems to us as a fat no in our face that it's so important that when we come face to face with those things that we struggle with, disagree with, that we at least, even if we don't necessarily say that we agree with the teaching, that we at least attempt to try to understand, to study, to examine, to pray about where am I with that and, and why uh, am I there with that and allow the possibility that our 20 to 30 years of life experience perhaps, that there's a chance that maybe there's some stronger wisdom and knowledge and guidance by the Holy Spirit in terms of the revelation that is given to us by God, by the church. Um, the interesting thing too with that is it's interesting to note that obviously we don't need the moral laws that our hearts are in line with. Um, so the example that is used is the fiance, you know, the fiance, the couple that's getting married, does the, does the man need that moral law, that number five commandment, you shall not murder your wife or your fiance? Does the man need that law? He doesn't need that law. Hopefully he doesn't need that law. Uh, hopefully he doesn't need that law because his heart is in line with that law. When our hearts are in line with the law, the laws do not seem like restrictions. They seem like basic human logic. It obviously seems quite sound and logical for me as a, as a fiancé to not murder my spouse, my, my soon-to-be spouse, because it coincides with the desires of my heart. So, when we come head-to-head -head with those laws that seem like are slapping us in the face that we disagree with, perhaps there is a possibility that our hearts are not in line with the law and that we should examine not changing the law, but perhaps the possibility of changing our hearts to coincide with God's law on that particular topic. Anyway, um, one last topic that came up last week, and before I move on to that, was there any questions about anything that, anything that's come up over the, because I'm kind of shifting gears with this last topic. No? Yes. Yeah, that's a very good question and a challenging question is we can and have some responsibility of continuing to share the knowledge, hopefully what we believe to be truth, with others. Um, I think that that's the, the reality of the gospel message, is to share the gift of the truth that, that we believe is given to us. Um, there are situations where that question legitimately comes up, is, is it better to leave someone in their ignorance in a certain scenario than to give them a truth that they will not accept. Um, and that's a, that's a difficult 
question. So there's situations where, well, I'm not going to go into that. But um, ultimately, I don't know that I have a scenario in my mind where we shouldn't, where we should choose to avoid speaking a truth, especially if the conversation comes up or the person asks a question or, or we get into a, a legitimate conversation with somebody. Obviously, I would say for the most part, that interaction, much in the same way that evangelization has to take place, is most times those moral conversations are not going to be impacting if we are just meeting somebody on the street corner for the first time, you know, and it's like we get into a heated discussion on morality. I don't know that that's the way to engage the topic. I would say most times it's it's encountering those individuals, building a relationship with those individuals as we grow in trust in relationship with those individuals, continuing to engage what we believe to be the truth of those moral teachings. Um, so I would compare it pretty much straight to the basic evangelization tactics that we would use the same technique in trying to share the gospel with somebody. Uh, as most times it's not going to be successful to go out and shout at people from the street corner, uh, hey, do you know Jesus? Um, most times evangelization takes root when we build a relationship with, with people that we have built a relationship with, we've come to know, um, and then we engage them in those conversations. Ultimately, they, ha they are bound to make decisions according to their conscience, and so they are the ones responsible for So we can't form somebody's conscience, but we can help them have the tools of knowledge to help their intellect in choosing according to a, a rightly formed conscience. Um, but ultimately, there is a moral obligation for them to choose to make choices according to the, form, the forming of their conscience. So... Sometimes that's going to be differing from what we might choose in that scenario. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's a tough... It's a, yeah, it's a tough situation or a tough um, conversation because that does affect it in a unique way in the sense that, that we are bound to, to choose according to our, our conscience. But behind that, it always has to be remembered that we are also bound to form our conscience rightly. Um, so it's a difficult balance. So anyway, I don't know if that helped at all or I just, okay. Okay. Any other questions? Going once. The last, uh, the topic that actually was posed two weeks ago um, that I didn't have a chance because we talked about heaven, hell, and purgatory. The question that came up is, what is the teaching of the church on Lucifer and demons? And how did that, how does that all, that whole story of Lucifer being the one who falls, uh, where does that all come from? Um, there's a couple of passages that we look at. Uh, Ezekiel 28. So in Ezekiel chapter 28, so that's uh, after Isaiah, after Jeremiah, after Lamentations. Let's just do 943 if you're uh, looking in the Red Bible. So chapter 28 starts off with the description of the Prince of Tyre, who is uh, basically an enemy of the people of Israel. So it describes him as a human being uh, and how that human being is at odds with basically with God. But then in verse 12, there's, or verse 11, there's a bit of a shift. 
So in verse 11, we start, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, raise a lament over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were a seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. In Eden, the garden of God, you lived. So again, here we see a de- we're going to see the story of a betrayal. And this per- these first verses talks about this individual was the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, and that they were present in the Garden of Eden. Precious stones of every kind were your covering, carnelian, topaz, beryl, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, garnet, and emerald. Their mounts and settings were wrought in gold, fashioned for you the day you were created. With a cherub I placed you, I put you on the holy mountain of God, where you walked among fiery stones. Blameless you were in your ways from the day you were created, until evil was found in you. Your commerce was full of lawlessness, and you sinned. Therefore I banished you from the mountain of God. The cherub drove you out from among the fiery stones. And it kind of continues with that description. Um, Typically that is one of the passages that is used to refer to the fall of Satan because Satan, Lucifer, that word Lucifer actually refers to the, uh, I mean the word actually is luce, Fur, luce being light, ifer is somebody who bears, so a crucifer is actually somebody who bears the cross, somebody who's a server who's carrying the cross is called a crucifer, lucifer is somebody, a bearer of light, and so the titles given to lucifer, son of the dawn, um, and perfect in beauty are some of the descriptions and that it was through this passage and through Isaiah, uh, I'm not going to have it off the top of my head. Isaiah 14. Okay, there we go. Uh, Verse 12, so starting with verse 12. How you have fallen from the heavens, O morning star, son of the dawn. How you have been cut down to the earth, you who conquered nations. In your heart you said, I will scale the heavens. Above the stars of God I will set up my throne. I will take my seat on the mount of assembly on the heights of Zaphon. I will send it above the tops of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. No, down to Sheol you will be brought to the depths of the pit. When they see you, they will stare, pondering over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world a wilderness, raised its cities, and gave captives no release? Um, So typically another passage that refers to the morning star the son of the dawn, which are titles that are given to, to Satan, to Lucifer, um, as the perfection of creation, and that he was given, as all the angels were given at the moment of their creation, the choice, the free will. So angels and angels are created with free will, but there is an instantaneous choice, and in the story of creation where. The story of creation describes the light being separated from the darkness. Typically, that is the imagery that is used to describe that moment in time when the choice was made by the angels to reject God uh, and to choose separation from God, which 
is the definition of hell, basically. So the existence of hell is not like a created place, but it is simply the separation of God, and therefore it is the place of demons and Satan, Lucifer, because um, they were the first to choose separation from God. I know that was a very quick brief, but those are just a couple of passages typically that are referenced in speaking of, of um, the son of the dawn, Lucifer. We are out of time. If there are questions that have been stirred, like I said at the break, please uh, use the question and answer box. And if I could have my volunteers to lead the prayer service. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ the Lord has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let us turn to him in humble but fervent petition, seeking the grace to root out from our hearts all trace of darkness and all that holds us back from walking in the full freedom of the children of God. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over, the, over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are all shadow of the things that were to come, the reality, however, is found in Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Jesus, victor over sin and death. Free our hearts. Jesus, source of light and hope. Free our hearts. Jesus, fullness of truth and mystery. Free our hearts. Jesus, teacher of seeking hearts. Free our hearts. Jesus, healer of the body and soul. Free our hearts. Jesus, who humble the heart and mind. Free our hearts. Jesus, release of captives. Free our hearts. Jesus, voice against violence. Free our hearts. Jesus, courage for the lowly, downtrodden. Free our hearts. Jesus, origin of all the authority and power. Free our hearts. Jesus, true lawgiver. Free our hearts. Jesus, unity of Lord and passion. Free our hearts. Jesus, freedom of the Spirit. Free our hearts. Lord, as you are a great model for that inner freedom which enables us to do the right, let us turn to you with confidence that we too may follow you to the fullness of spiritual freedom. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Uh, two things really quickly. The schedule, if you glance at that really quick for the spring semester, is next week, get this, we're going to be on schedule. Whoa. Yep. So the next, <laughs> the next three weeks, we're actually going to be according to the schedule. So next week is liturgical year. Holy Week and rites explained, so we'll talk a little bit about what's going to happen during Holy Week, 
The following week, we'll spend the, pretty much the whole time going through the Easter Vigil rite, and then the following Tuesday is going to be the Seder meal. Um, so if you have a class or something to that effect that is going to necessitate you missing that, um, too bad for you, because uh, the Seder meal is kind of a cool, kind of a cool deal. So if at all possible for you to be able to make that, it would be great. But it is on a Tuesday, and I know you're Wednesday nighters. But um, if if at all possible, that would be great. But at the same time, I understand conflicts, and that's why you're here on Wednesday, perhaps. So, um, but yeah, the Seder meal is typically the meal that's done on Holy Thursday. But because Holy Thursday is craziness, uh, we move it to earlier in the week. But we have it just for the, for the RCIA crew. So it's kind of a neat experience of the Passover meal in a simple way, obviously. Uh, so we do some substituting for some of the things that are traditionally Passover. But we have lamb and all that good stuff. So uh, that's that week. And then basically we're into the Easter Vigil. So... Yeah, we have just basically the next two, two weeks of class time, and one of those is rehearsal. So uh, The other thing is there's a sign-up sheet if you had not seen it on the table over there. For those of you who are just receiving confirmation, uh, who are not going, for, for those who are not going to be baptized on the Easter Vigil, the taking the opportunity for confession, so there is a sign-up sheet for confession times. Uh, and let me know if, if one of those two days will not work for you, uh, and we can, get a, we can find another time. But if you were to look at that, we'll see you next week. God bless.